So we're really <laughs> lucky. Uh, we've gotten super access to the heliport. So um, the, uh, the guy that's our guide with the um, helitac crew is going to see if he can get permission from the pilots uh, to go over and see. These are considered the heavy, the heavy lifting aircraft. There's a, a Chinook. There's a, was this Skymax? Uh, maybe. And then there's also the big ones, the cranes down there. So uh, hopefully, cross your fingers, we can uh, talk to the pilot. So you're the pilot? Really? One, of the pilots. One of the pilots? Yeah, they built 37 of them in the mid-1990s for the logging industry, for logging. Okay. That's what they were designed for. And now they find that water buckets are good for them, or power line construction, or whatever. So they but, must be able to lift but, quite a bit. Yeah, they'll lift 6,000 pounds. Wow! Yeah, not as much as the bigger machines, but for it's kind of the mid mid-size you know weight that, that does a lot of good for people like for logging now the logs are all smaller so 6,000 pounds is plenty yeah for power line construction we can lift all the steel parts you know for building towers and that sort of thing so I'm assuming that those are those counter rotate that's why there's no tail rotor yeah the torque of one drive shaft cancels the torque of the other because they go in opposite directions <laughs> Wow that is a beautiful aircraft. Now, do you, are you do you pilot for all different kinds of things, or only for fires, or? Um, yeah, we do all co different kinds of contract work. We're, we're on a fire contract that goes from July 30th to November 30th. Okay. So that's what that's all we do right now. But the, during the spring, the winter and spring and early summer, we're usually out doing power line construction work. Okay. And do you do ski resorts as we, well? We've done ski lifts, ski towers, that sort of thing. Wow. That is unreal. He's taking his bucket with him. When we're doing construction work, we do, we have a long line, we call this a long line. We have a long line with a hook at the bottom, uh -huh. and it's electric operated hook. So they can hook me up to it, a load, I can take it somewhere and set it. Then I push the button and that releases that hook at the bottom. This is the this is the button right there. That's the button right there. Now is this called the collective here? This is the collective. And that's that's the cyclic. The cyclic. And, those, and it's got pedals. And the like, pedals. Just like a conventional helmet. So instead of the pedals controlling the tail rotor, they're controlling the, the pitch of the main blades? Uh, all of the control inputs go to these flaps. If you look at these flaps up on the rotor blade. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. In different, in different proportions, depending on what you want the helicopter to do. Because without a tail rotor, you have to get a difference in torque between the one drive shaft and the other one to get it to actually do a turning, a hovering turn or do a maneuver. So is it, is it can, can a, a, a pilot from a traditional helicopter get in and fly one of these right away, or is it very different? Pretty much, but it, it is different. The coordination is different. When he first gets into it, he'd be a little confused by the difference in the coordination, but uh, with a little explanation, you, you can figure you can. it out. You yeah. can. Interesting. So I, I went from conventional helicopters to these, and it took me a few days of messing around with it to, to get a feel for the coordination. So that's got to be tricky because I don't see um, an instructor seat in here. No. They use a, <laughs> so you're on your own. For the transition, they use what they call the H-43 Husky, which is an older model command helicopter that has the exact same rotor system on it. And it's a two-person, two two-pilot helicopter. Okay. So you go out with a check pilot, and you learn to do all the emergency procedures, and you learn to fly it. You do about two hours of flight time in the Husky. And then they push this out, and then you're on your own, and they talk to you on the radio while you do all the maneuvers. So you've got to be on your game, because you're, you're flying the helicopter, you're working navi doing navigation, you're working the radios. That's yeah. a handful. You have to, yeah, you can see my organization yeah. up, yeah, well, up gonna, on the Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that. That's, that's my game right there. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so you write your, all your radio frequencies. I've been, I've been working fires for the last week and a half, and different fires. They've been sending me from one fire to another, so I've got different set of frequencies and, and uh, 
radio settings and, and navigation aids for the different fires. So, so this you is. You hope you don't accidentally. But that's, it. that's how I that's how I keep it all organized. Is I write on the window. So this is interesting. Your your critical instruments are yeah. out here. So when you look it out. I'll show you. I'm leaning to the left and I'm looking at this opening in the bubble here and these are the critical instruments for that so I don't have to look inside the cockpit. And so you have, uh, what do you have, you have torque there? Well we have the, the weight, torque and temperature. Oh so you can measure, so does this measure the, the weight, the load? That, yeah there's a, a load cell that actually figures out how much the load weighs so that I can read it right here. So this this uh, runs on this bearing uh, as you're just it's just active the whole time. Yeah, it's so when you bank there. when you bank well what it what it does is instead of putting the arm of the load pivoting at the bottom of this fuselage when that thing slides it puts the arm of the load 18 inches be, below the rotor and that allows allows me to have more use of my lateral side to side cycling because are so close together. Oh, interesting. Wow. So other, the other air, uh, helicopters are not going to have this design? Uh, there are a few that do have a sliding hook, but it's not really for the same reason. It's, wow. This, it, this, one, this one, because the rotors are mounted so close together, the side-to-side -side control is real critical. And so that's why the hook slides and puts the arm of the load to pivot point. Pivot point is actually 18 inches below the rotor hook. So now the button you showed us on the, the collective uh, dumps the bucket. Do you have a way of dumping the whole cable if you got into trouble? <laughs> oh, so really simple. I... Yep. Uh, <laughs> so if it gets hung up, or you can dump the whole load? Yep. Yeah, you can let go of the entire line and get rid of it to get it out of your way. Interesting. Now, how many gallons is your baby bucket here? 700 gallons. 700. And the Hueys was how big? Smaller. It was 200. 200 gallons? So, yeah. So, what, uh, like 700 gallons of water, what does that do when you dump it? Like, I mean. Hopefully, it puts the fire out. <laughs> but I mean, like, how big of an area does that cover? Oh, or how, you know, what does it You know, it depends. You can do, uh, you can do a running drop where you cover a large area with spray. Uh, I don't. I can't tell you uh -huh. exact dimensions. Yeah. Or you can do like a, a spot drop where they want a concentration of water in one place, like on a single tree or something. So you just put, you just push the button, come to a stop, and push the button. And do they tell you, or do you kind of assess the situation when you're up well, there? Well, well, when you're working with ground crews, they let you know what they want. Okay. You know, if they want you to do the fire perimeter, or if they want you to do a spot drop. But when a lot of times we're out working on our own, and we're just trying to make our best the best call of what'll work and what'll do some good. You know, there's reasons why we go to certain areas of the fire to work. Yeah, because you're, you're the ones who can yeah. get there. Yeah. And how, what about if it's so smoky? Can you fly in that or? Well, that's the problem today is we're supposed to go down to Happy Camp. Uh -huh. We're supposed to relocate this machine down to Happy Camp. And they say it's so smoked in down there right now we can't get in. Oh. Interesting. What a beautiful. Like Jack, do you want to hop in? No, thank you. No. I, I would love to climb in. We, we went to the uh, Missoula smoke jumpers. Oh, yeah. And it, uh, we're, I'm not sure if it's wow. coming out. Oh, great, great visibility. Over. What's that? I think you guys might have a mission. They're getting called out. Okay. So we're going to have you have. We were so very fortunate to get to access uh, to the flight crews and the pilots and the aircraft. So interesting. One of the most interesting things and some of the most interesting people I've ever met. So right over there, I'll have, whoops, over there. <laughs> See, I was trying to get all clever and like make you think that I was actually looking at a video that was playing over there before I've even made it. That didn't work out very well, did it? So uh, I haven't made that video yet, but the next video, I just wanted to give you a little teaser there, is going to be of the Sky Crane, which uh, is amazing, amazing. So I'll put that together and try to get that up as soon as possible. Uh, if you enjoyed these videos, please take a moment and click the thumbs up. I really appreciate it. it um, I, I, just, I just do. So is that it? Yeah, I think so. Well. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry for the poor audio. It was terrible, I know, but uh, uh, that new camera I have has a horrible microphone. 
and it doesn't have a hot shoe and and I'm not going to complain about it it just it is what it is so until it breaks and we're outside I guess that's how it's going to have to be so very disappointing we'll see you guys next time mm -hmm.